In this video, we're going to discuss a theory that allows us to determine the three-dimensional shape of a molecule. Let's start with a quick list of the learning objectives that are going to be in this video. Uh, we're going to start with a quick review of what a Lewis dot structure is and then go right into the limitations of Lewis dot structures. Uh, they're a valuable uh, tool we use in chemistry, but they don't tell us everything that we need to know about a molecule. The other half of that coin with Lewis dot structures comes with something new known as Vesper theory. We'll first discuss what the concept of Vesper theory is, what it is and how it works. Uh, we'll talk about the resulting 3D shapes that are made as a result of Vesper theory. We'll then organize that information into what we'll call a Vesper chart, a resource that you'll be using throughout the year. Uh, and last but not least, we'll end with some example problems allowing you to see a first glimpse of what it looks like to use Vesper theory to create three-dimensional shapes of molecules. At the end of the day, the entire video is really about taking the three, a two-dimensional shape that we get from Lewis dot structures, like this shape right here for the substance ethanol, and translating it ultimately into a three-dimensional representation of what the molecule actually looks like. And again, as valuable as Lewis dot structures are to telling us connectivity in molecules, it's these three-dimensional shapes that really start to give us insight into the chemical nature of a substance. So let's start with a review of Lewis dot structures. The most important thing to remember about Lewis dot structures is that they are a two-dimensional representation of how atoms are connected together. And that's really the only information that a Lewis dot structure is capable of providing us. It's a simplified Bohr model configuration. So we take all the electrons from the Bohr model and focus only on the ones that are involved in bonding, the valence or outermost electrons. We then use that simplified Bohr model to identify lone electrons uh, because we know lone electrons where a is where a bond conformed. And then we know the configuration for the entire structure is complete when all the atoms are connected together and all atoms have reached an octet. If any of these details are unclear to you, uh, it's very important to make sure that you're comfortable with Lewis dot structures before you proceed. I very strongly recommend stopping this video, going back and watching the video on Lewis dot structures, and then coming back to this when you're a little more comfortable with the concept. Now, as I suggested earlier on in the discussion, Lewis dot structures have limitations. Lewis dot structures only show connectivity, how the atoms are linked together. They do not show any information about the shape of a molecule. As an example of that, we can look at this substance over here on the left. We have a Lewis dot structure of this compound. Uh, the name of this compound would be 2-bromopropane. And we can see it has that special name because of the bromine atom here on the center carbon atom. We can draw this Lewis dot structure in this fashion as well. It certainly looks very different, but the name of this substance is 2-bromopropane. It is the same exact chemical. All the Lewis dot structure is telling us is that the bromine is connected to the second carbon in the chain, just like this bromine is connected to the second carbon in the chain. The fact that we drew it up here versus down here doesn't have any bearing whatsoever on the connectivity of this molecule. Clearly, however, where the bromine physically shows up in the molecule, whether on one side or the other, can potentially have an impact on its chemical behavior, which is why the Lewis dot structure, while valuable, doesn't provide us with all the information we need to understand the nature of a chemical substance. Enter the new chemical concept, Vesper theory. Vesper theory's job is to convert the two-dimensional Lewis dot structures that we've identified already into three-dimensional representations of the actual shape of the molecule. This is going to provide us with that extra information that uh, Lewis dot structures weren't capable of providing. We'll be able to take the flat picture of ethanol here and convert it into this three-dimensional representation that we showed on the overview slide. We'll talk about the steps and processes to get there, but first, let's start with the description a little more about what Vesper theory is all about. So as you might have guessed, uh, the term Vesper, spelled very strangely, is actually an acronym for something more complicated. It stands for Valence Shell Electron Pair Repulsion. And we'll actually talk about this theory in two separate parts. We'll talk about the Valence Shell part first. We'll talk about the Electron Pair part second but all of them deal with this concept of repulsion, which is going to be the key idea to how this theory actually works. Let's talk about some of the major assumptions made in the theory that allow us to get to shape. 
First of all, the thing we'll say is that all atoms are surrounded by a shell of negatively charged electrons. And the fact that they're negatively charged is what's going to be important for us. All of those like charged electrons are going to repel one another. They're going to push apart. We learned that last year in physics. As a result, if you put these two things together, if the atoms are surrounded by electrons and the electrons repel one another, we can therefore say that the atoms in this compound are going to repel one another. They're going to want to push themselves apart. So let's tie all this together then and how the actual model works. The atoms in a molecule will arrange themselves as far apart as possible in order to reduce the repulsion forces between them. They're trying to minimize those repulsion forces. The arrangement of atoms, therefore, has everything as far apart as possible is what defines the actual shape of the molecule. So when all the atoms in a molecule get themselves as far apart as they can possibly be, whatever shape we have at that particular point in time must be the final shape of the molecule itself because that's the shape that reduces the repulsion forces between individual atoms. Let's see if we can clarify that then by actually drawing one of the models and kind of walking ourselves through the process of Vesper theory. So we'll start with something relatively simple. Uh, we're going to use this terminology up here, this AX terminology, to identify Vesper shapes. Uh, we're going to think of Vesper shapes as always having a central atom, and we're going to denote those with the letter A, and we're going to have a certain number of atoms connected. to that central atom. And as you'll see as we talk about this more, this really kind of hovers around this central atom concept. Now the formula here, this generalized formula, is basically going to represent any compound with a central atom and two things connected to it. So let's see if we can draw a picture of what that's going to look like. Uh, we'll start with our central atom A. We'll draw a circle and label the letter A. Uh, we'll attach two other atoms to it labeled X and X. Now we can imagine that these X atoms are free to rotate wherever they want around this central atom. But keep in mind, they are also surrounded by that field of negatively charged electrons. So we've got negative electrons here, and we've got negative electrons here, and as a result, the repulsion forces are going to push these guys afar, apart in this particular direction. They're going to keep moving apart until they get as far apart as they can possibly be, resulting in the new shape that's going to look like this. If we arrange the two X atoms at an angle of 180 degrees to one another, there's no direction that they can now move in, either this way or this way, that'll get them any further apart. If they start moving in either of these two directions, they'll start getting closer together. The repulsion force in that side of the molecule will increase and it'll push them back in this other direction again. The end result is we figured out the furthest possible place that these two elements can be from one another in order to result in a minimized, um, minimized repulsion forces. And this must be the three-dimensional Vesper shape for any molecule that has this particular configuration, AX2. As an example, we could think of the molecule carbon dioxide, for example, with the central atom being carbon and two oxygens attached. We would describe this as this particular shape. And later on, we'll talk about the fact that these shapes also have names. This molecule is known as a linear configuration. Now, so far, we've all only talked about one part of Vesper theory, and that is the part involving the valence shells. Uh, valence shells, if you haven't already figured out, are basically the atoms involved in the shape of a molecule, and we have finished that conversation. The second part of the discussion we haven't talked about yet is this part right here. Electron pairs also play a role in this process, and as I said before, everything is involved in repulsion. So let's start talking about the effect that electron pairs have on the shape of a molecule. So electron pairs on the central atom, and I cannot stress this statement enough, there's going to be a lot of electron pairs that are not necessarily important for us. It's only the ones that are actually on the central atom itself. But electron pairs on that central atom 
also repel other electron pairs and valence shells. This means that these electron pairs act as a place in the Vesper shape, just like the three X's in our previous model represented locations in the actual molecule. An electron pair is going to occupy one of those locations. But even though it takes up a location, it's going to leave a gap in the actual picture. As opposed to getting a three atoms evenly distributed about the molecule, we're going to get those atoms distributed in a different place because our electron pair is going to be pushing them around just like other atoms would do. So let's take a look at what that might look like in an example. And the first example we'll come across with an electron pair in it is going to be in any molecule that has what we'll call an AX2E configuration. Uh, e, as we've already kind of suggested, stands for electron pairs on the central atom. So the way we identify electron pairs on the central atom is by drawing Lewis dot structures first. A Lewis dot structure that contains an electron pair uh, would be something like this. We'd have this guy connected to the three X's, the three things connected to it, and then there'd be this pair of what we call non-bonding electrons on the top. Uh, if you've done a bunch of Lewis dot structures, we do end with these dots a lot. We just haven't had a chance to talk about their relationship to how things are, uh, are going to determine the actual three-dimensional shape. So just like before, we're going to expect that these two atoms here are going to push against one another, these two atoms here are going to push against one another, but now we also need to treat this shell of electrons, this orbital here, uh, as something that's going to push against the other atoms as well. And we're going to expect that all three, all of these things basically, are going to orient themselves to push stuff as far apart as possible. So we're going to introduce two things, I would say, at this time. The, the electron pair, which we've already discussed about, uh, but we're also going to introduce the idea that we, this is a three-dimensional model. Uh, your first inclination as to what this shape might be actually might be something very similar because this produces 90-degree angles for all of these uh, substances, and that's as far apart as they can be when forced to be two-dimensional. Uh, in actuality, the shape we're really going to get when you expand into three dimensions uh, is going to look a little something like this. Uh, we're going to have one of those x's off in this direction, Direction. We're going to have one of those X's coming out of the screen at you. We tend to draw a triangular shaped line here to provide some little forced perspective. And then another one of those X's here uh, drawn back into the screen, which we use a dotted line to show. We'll notice this creates a little pyramid shape. And on the top of this pyramid, we're going to get that non-bonding pair of electrons. This actually separates all of these guys by closer to 109 degrees as opposed to uh, the 90 degrees we see we get increased separation here by using the third dimension. What's important to notice though is that the molecule has, the shape anyway, has the three valence shells here at the bottom and this non-bonding electron pair at the top. The non-bonding electron pair is taking one of the four positions in the shape, but the resulting shape is the molecule underneath. It's, this is the shape that we're actually interested in because this is where our atoms are going to end up being. The electron pair manipulates that shape, but it's not part of the final picture. Uh, earlier, we identified a trigonal planar shape as being a flat triangle. This guy is known as trigonal pyramidal because it forms a pyramid shape with a triangular base. Now we've identified a few Vesper shapes that result from this idea of the Vesper theory and repulsion, but in actuality there's many more. Uh, what you'll find at the bottom of the web page here is a chart similar to this one that has a long list of the different Vesper shapes that are available to us. And this is actually a small fraction of the larger list of Vesper shapes that are possible out there in the world of chemistry, but it's certainly enough to get us started into this theory. You have the names of each of the individual shapes listed here. Uh, the Vesper formulas you'll find are valuable tools to use to identify what type of chemical you're dealing with or what shape your molecule forms into. And then last but not least, we have images of what the pictures actually look like to help you in the drawing process. I would argue that this table is invaluable in, in the terms of being able to convert Lewis dot structures into Vesper shapes, especially at the beginning of the process. If you haven't already done so, pause the video, download the actual chart itself, make sure it is part of your notes either electronically or on paper, and then continue on to the next slide where we'll do one last example. 
To wrap this up, we're going to go through an example for the compound NH3, otherwise known as ammonia. Uh, this is a very common um, Vesper shape to work with, as it is a very common substance to be dealing with in the lab. Uh, to start the process of identifying the three-dimensional shape of NH3, uh, it's very important to first start with the Lewis dot structure. I am not going to go through the details on how to produce a Lewis dot structure for a substance. There are videos that can go on that. Uh, however, when you're done, you're going to get a structure that looks like this right here. Nitrogen started with five electrons that made one pair here on the central atom and three open spaces to attach these hydrogens to, and that's the Lewis dot structure we have. Here's now where you'll take some time to reference your Vesper chart to figure out what it is we're dealing with. You're going to want to translate the information in your Lewis dot structure into one of these Vesper formulas, these AX formulas. We have a central atom, nitrogen, which is our A. We have three hydrogens attached to it, creating the formula AX3, but we also have this non-bonding pair of electrons on the central atom, which creates an E. So this is an AX3E formula. If you recall from earlier on, the AX3E configuration refers to a trigonal planar substance. And the picture of that is this picture right here. All we need to do is redraw our Lewis dot structure with this particular picture, and we'll have a three-dimensional representation of what our molecule looks like. We'll put the nitrogen in the center again. We'll draw that triangular shaped bond to denote that the first hydrogen is coming out of the board and towards us. The second bond we'll draw using the dotted lines and the third bond we'll draw using the bold line to represent that it's in the plane of the board. And we'll add in the pair of non-bonding electrons to the top. And now we have an accurate representation of the three-dimensional shape uh, of, the form of the compound ammonia. And that's about it. Uh, at this point in time, you should be able to describe what the purpose of Vesper theory is to generate three-dimensional shapes out of two-dimensional Lewis dot structures. Uh, you should be able to describe very briefly how a Vesper shape goes about doing that, uh, the idea that it's minimizing repulsion forces. And then most importantly, I would say out of this whole list, uh, you should be able to apply Vesper theory. You draw the Lewis dot structure first, you reference the structure to something on your Vesper chart, and then you redraw the shape of that molecule in a three-dimensional plane uh, with the information from your Vesper chart itself. We obviously will spend time practicing this theory in class, but generally speaking, uh, once you get an idea of how the theory works, application of it tends to be relatively simple and figured out with just a couple practice problems.